Uh, Exodus chapter number 21 this evening uh, may be a less than familiar text of Scripture to you. Once we have moved towards chapter 20 and 21 and beyond that uh, is where many people begin to bail out of their yearly Bible reading because things start slowing down just a little bit. Up to this point, it's all been cupcakes and puppy dogs and rainbows and been fun reading up to this point. Uh, but you start getting into the later chapters of Exodus and specifications of the temple and laws concerning Israel, get into Leviticus and Numbers, and brother, if you can make it through there, you can make it through anything. Say amen. And, uh, and, and a lot of people just kind of decide, well, I'm just going to go back and anchor down over there and something like I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And you end up missing a blessing. Because there's a lot of good stuff even back in the Old Testament that even though it may not be directly written to us, it is written directly for us. And it's all profitable this evening. In chapter number 20, we understand what chapter 20 is. It, it's the Big Ten. It's God giving the law, the Ten Commandments, on two tables of testament to Moses on top of Mount Sinai. We're all very aware and familiar with that. But just as soon as God gives the law that condemns man, just as soon as God hands down the law that shows us how rotten we are, how filthy we are, how ungodly we are, and how every one of us have broken all ten of the laws that God writes down in chapter 20 and hands to Moses, immediately after the law that condemns us, God gives us grace that restores us. God gives us a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter number 21, giving grace to sinners like you and I. It was the law that came by Moses, but thank God right on the heels of that was grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Right after we find the law in chapter 20, God nestles a beautiful little picture of the good saving grace of our Savior in chapter number 21, verses 1 through 6. Would you read this with me tonight? Follow with me. Verse number 1, chapter 21. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve. And in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall not go out or, or shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. Tonight I'm real interested in verse number five, even though we're going to preach down through these verses tonight. Verse five is my heart to transfer to you. Verse five, and if the servant shall plainly say, without hesitation, without reservation, without holding anything back, the servant would plainly say, I love my master. My wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the door post. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Tonight, I'm interested in verse 5 in what the servant would plainly say. And I don't even have an original title tonight. I'm just going to piggyback on what the servant said all these thousands of years ago. Is that all right with y'all? I'm, I'm just going to preach his message that he already preached. And tonight I just want to preach out of the text for a few minutes on the subject of I love my master. I love my master. Here in the text we find that a servant that was bought and paid for could get to the end of seven years, Brother Jordan, in serving a master. Get to the end of his time when he had an opportunity to go out and do his own thing and live for himself, make a name for himself, build something for himself, get out from under the wing of this man that he had lived with for seven years. He has the opportunity to do so. But he's lived so long now with the master, he can't imagine going back to living without the master. He wakes up on this day and he says, I can't imagine a day living out from under his roof. I can't imagine a day not hearing his voice. 
I can't imagine a day not being around his very presence. I can't imagine living my own life, doing my own thing, carrying on in my own way. I just want to live the rest of my life doing exactly what he wants me to do. I want to live the rest of my life in his house. I want to live the rest of my life around his face. I want to live the rest of my life doing his business instead of my own. I, I've just become so head over heels, enthralled with his character, enthralled with his nature, totally captivated by who and by what he is and by his good in this servant's life that I do not want to go out free. I don't want another master. I don't want to be my own master. I love this master and I think I'll just stay with him for the rest of my life. Now some of y'all sitting in here tonight, you may hear me tell this story and say, Preacher, that's the craziest thing I ever heard of. Why in the world would someone given the opportunity to go out and live on their own, being their own master, be the own guide and be the own guard Part of their life. Why in the world would somebody say, I, I, I don't want to. I want somebody else to have control over my life. I want somebody else to have the reins of my life. I want somebody else to be the leader of my life. This, this is an absolutely crazy concept to me, preacher. I can't imagine someone that would rather live in servitude than live in freedom outside of a master. And can I say tonight, if you feel that way, maybe it's because you ain't met the right master because if you ever meet the right master tonight if you ever meet the one that some of us met tonight if you ever come in contact with the one that some of us are shouting about and some of us are crying about some of us are worshiping about some of us are singing about some of us are preaching about if you ever come in contact with that master you might just throw in with me and the servant tonight and say I love my master you say preacher who is that master that master is clearly defined in the New Testament as the Lord Jesus Christ. It was Jesus. Everybody's interested in what Jesus said. Jesus said this in John chapter 13. He said, you call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. Jesus said, I am the Master, and I am the Lord. That's who I am. And I thank God this evening that one day as a teenage boy, I met the Master of my soul. I met the Shepherd and the Bishop of my soul. I'm not looking for another master. I don't want another master. I ain't hunting another master. I ain't seeking another master. I have found I have found the one whom my soul loves. I am totally captivated by his nature. I'm totally taken by who he is and what he is and what he's done and what he's doing and where he's taking me to. I have no desire to do my own thing. I've lived so long with him brother Foster I can't imagine living without him I can't imagine a day getting up and doing my own thing with no thought to Jesus Christ it was, imagine that concept some of y'all that's lived with Jesus Christ for as long as some of y'all have lived for him imagine a day getting up and saying you know what today I'm just going to do whatever I want to do with no thought and no restraint whatsoever for what Jesus Christ wants. That's an absolutely foreign thought. To, good gracious, that grieves me just thinking about it. I, I'm not saying I don't mess up, I do. But brother, there's never been a conscious decision since I've been saved that I'm just going to live today with no thought whatsoever to him. Just leave me alone, I'm going to do my own thing. No, sir. I can't imagine living a day without reading his word, uh, without talking to him, without singing a song uh, that has his name or his word in it. Brother, he is the heartbeat of my life and I love my master this evening. <laughs> Where have we gotten to? We have messed up somewhere along the track, Preacher Foster, in the day which we live. We've gotten this mindset that God is some sort and some way our servant and we're the masters and we command him around. He's the glorified bellhop. That's not the way it is. We don't call the shots in our life. We can't do what we want to do and be what we want to be and go where we want to go and say what we want to say and listen to what we want to listen to and be whoever that's not possible anymore he should have control over our life 
The authors of the New Testament understood what I'm preaching about tonight. Whether the New Testament church in 2022 understands it or not is absolutely immaterial. The authors of the New Testament understood exactly what I'm preaching on. You say, how do you know that? Because Paul starts off Romans chapter 1 and verse number 1 by saying, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. James says in James chapter 1 verse 1, James, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant of the Lord Jesus. Jude said in Jude verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. All the authors of the New Testament realized and recognized he's the master they were the servant they wasn't giving orders they was taking orders and they was happy 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 being the servant of Jesus Christ you know what the greatest advertisement is for Jesus the greatest advertisement for Jesus Christ is happy servants happy servants I ain't mad about being a Christian brother Lancaster I ain't sad about being a Christian. I ain't in here tonight like, man, I wish Jesus had to save me. Now I can't enjoy life no more. No, you ain't enjoying life if you ain't living for Jesus. I, you know what the Bible said in the book of 1 Kings and right over there, chapter 9, 10, somewhere along in there, the Bible said the queen of Sheba came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And when she come to hear the wisdom of Solomon, the Bible said that when she got down there, she came to prove him with hard questions and said that he told her all that was in her heart until there was no more spirit left in her. But I want you all to understand something. It wasn't his answers that knocked the spirit out of her. Go back and read it. It's not the answers and the wisdom of Solomon that knocks the spirit out of her. What knocks the spirit out of Solomon is Solomon's servants. The Bible said when she saw the apparel of his ministers, the attendance of his cupbearers, and it said this, she said this, this was her own testimony. The Queen of Sheba said this. She said, Happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and hear thy word. The Queen of Sheba said this. She said, uh, You know, I got servants too. I'm a queen, you know. I mean, I'm from down there in Sheba. I got servants too. But I'm going to tell you something, Solomon. My servants don't act like your servants act. I got servants too. But my servants, they don't love me like your servants love you. Solomon, when my servants come in, they clock in right on time and clock out right on time. They ain't getting there early and they ain't staying late. And then when they come in, they walk up and say, What you want to drink? I'd like some tea. They come in, they, as you t- what else you want today? They ain't happy about it. You can tell they ain't happy about being a servant. I see them over by the water cooler talking bad about me and talking junk about me. But Solomon, your servants are a whole different breed. Why, when your servants come walking up, they got a smile on their face. I hear them walking off singing songs. And man, they don't just run off when the service and the meeting's over with. They hang around and they say they want to just stay around and hear your wisdom some more. Solomon, they love you to death. You know the greatest advertisement for Jesus Christ is servants just like that. Servants that are absolutely in love with Jesus. They sing songs about Jesus. They tell people about Jesus. They worship Jesus. They lift up Jesus. Their life's all about Jesus. The greatest advertisement is happy servants. I know some servants of Jesus that if if what they got is what servanthood should be, I don't want it. You know the Bible said, no man, this is Jesus said this, I'll quote another Jesus quote, no man can serve two masters. He'll love one and despise the other or he'll cling to the one and hate the other. No man can serve God and mammon. In other words, you can't serve Jesus on revival day and on Sunday and then go serve yourself Monday through Saturday. Jesus doesn't want a weekend relationship with his servants. He wants full-time relationship with his servants. I love my master tonight. I'll just encourage you for a few minutes on this thought about I love my master. There are some reasons why I love my master, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you read chapter 21 in these first six verses, my reasons are the exact same reasons why this guy loved his master. 
All of the reasons why he loves the master are all in the text tonight. Can I show you three reasons why this guy said he loved his master and are the same reasons why I love my master tonight? Number one, I love my master because of a purchase. I love my master because of a purchase. Did you notice the first thing that is said about this guy and his relationship to his master? Did you see what brings the master and the servant into contact? What brings them initially into their relationship is a purchase gets made. Watch the first three words of verse 2. The first three words of verse 2. If thou buy. What brings the servant and the master into contact anyways? There was a purchase made that brought these two lives together. The master bought the servant. And I thought to myself, Preacher Foster, why? Did this man need purchasing in the first place? Why did he need buying? Why, why was he standing on this auction block? And it hit me like this. The reason why he's on the auction block is because of bad choices he has made. The reason why he wound up on this auction block, Brother James, it's not because of something the master did or somebody else did. It's because of something he done. Somewhere in this man's immediate past, he had made a bunch of bad, stupid decisions, and now they're coming back to haunt him. He has borrowed so much money that he cannot pay it back. He has, listen to me now, he has accrued a debt that's higher than he can pay off. His debt is way up over his head. And now the creditors have come and said, Hey, Pay up. Well, I can't pay up. Well, we taking your barn and we taking your livestock and we selling your land off. Now we're going to auction your house off. Now we, everything you got's gone. And last of all, after it's all been sold because he can't pay for it and he's got a debt clear up over his eyeballs, now he stands on the auction block himself and now he's being sold last of all. Yep. You know what this is a picture of? It's a picture of us. You say, I ain't never been in a shape like that. Yeah, yeah, you have. This is what Paul said about all us in here tonight. Paul said, Romans chapter 7, For I am carnal, sold under sin. Paul knows what it's like to have a debt of sin mounted up over his head that he cannot pay for tonight. You know how mankind wound up in the bad place we in tonight? Your bad decisions. Yours. Let's just bring it right down where we are. Your bad decisions is what was sending you to hell. You're a sinner by birth, sinner by nature, and sinner by choice. I know how we get. I know how we get. We start understanding a little bit of the Bible, and when we do, we start shifting the blame for what we are to somebody else. We all start saying, well, you know, it ain't my fault why I turned out like I am. It's, it's Adam and Eve's fault back over there. Come on now. Come on now. Come on, y'all, look up in here. Put your thick caps on with me for just a minute. Are you really going to blame your dirty mouth and your dirty thoughts and you being ugly to your wife and you being mean to your husband? Are you really going to blame the things you've done wrong in the last week or so? You're going to blame that on some folk that died 6,000 years ago? I mean, really, you're going to blame all your bad choices and all your sinful decisions on two folk being dead 6,000 years? Let them folk be dead and go on to wherever they went to. Just leave them alone tonight. They dead and gone a long time ago. If you was in the Garden of Eden 6,000 years ago, you'd have ate the fruit just like they did. We'd all been in the same shape just like we are. Don't act like you're something special or something different. Your own bad choices is why you have wound up on the auction block of sin tonight. It was our own bad choices. This man's own bad decisions. But, but, yet, but yet, enter the master. Enter the good man of the story. See, it's, the story ain't about the servant. It's all about the master. We'll find that out in a moment we go. All of a sudden, this good man steps up and he sees the plight of this poor old fellow that's messed up in bad shape. I mean, everything's gone. It's all, and by the good grace and mercy of his own kind heart, he steps up and says, I'll buy him. I'll take him 
and I'll put him back on his feet. I'll, I'll restore to him everything that his bad decisions have cost him. I'll take him. But wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. On the day that he buys the servant, he can't just <laughs> he can't just buy the man. He's got to pay off all the man's debts too. See, the man still owes a lot of stuff. He can't just step up and say, well, what's that guy cost? Well, he cost, you know, $95. Cost 120 bucks. Okay, I'll pay it. No, 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 no. It's deeper than that. See, the man's got a mountain of debt attached to him. This man is inseparably tied to the debt that he has caused. Somebody's got to pay that off so that this man can go free with somebody. And so the good man steps up, walks to the first creditor, and he says, uh, what's he owe you? He says, well, I'm telling you, he spent this and this and this and couldn't pay for that. This is what he owes me, okay? Paid off. Paid in full. He don't owe you nothing. You can't, you can't never come back and say that he owes you a dime. I've paid it off. He don't owe you anything. It's all been paid for. What's he owe you? Well, he owes me this much, all right? All right, now you're settled up. He don't owe you anything. You can't ever come back and say he owes you nothing. And when the master walks out of that place with that servant, nobody can say the servant owes them nothing. The master has paid it all off. He ain't, be he ain't beholden to nobody. There is no creditor that can come back and say, hey, you owe me. There is therefore now no condemnation. Who shall lay in? <laughs> Glory to God. Who shall lay anything? Thing to the charge of God's elect. Brother, you looking at a man tonight that when Jesus bought me, he didn't get much when he got me. But I'll tell you what he did for me. Uh, he stepped up to the plate and in one single substitutionary act of sacrificial love and mercy on an old rugged cross, paid my debt off, paid my fine off, wiped it all clean with the rich red royal redeeming blood of the Lamb of Calvary. We were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold but with the precious blood of Christ and tonight I owe nothing it's been paid off nothing over my head nothing in my past nothing in my future nothing in my present it's all been taken care of <laughs> all gone paid for I love my master. <laughs> Dark the stain that soiled man's nature. Long the distance that he fell. He was far removed from hope and heaven into deep despair and hell. But there was a fountain open and the blood of God's own Son. It purifies our souls and reaches deeper than our stains have gone. So praise the Lord for full salvation. God still reigns upon His throne. And I know His blood still reaches deeper than my stains have gone. Gone. Hallelujah tonight. I like that so good I'm going to sing another verse. When with holy angels standing in the presence of our King and our hearts get filled with wonder as that wide robe choir sings then we'll praise the name of Jesus with those millions round the throne we'll praise him for that blood that reached down deeper than our stains have gone Man, how could you not love somebody like Jesus Christ? What a master tonight. What a savior tonight. What a Lord tonight. I love my master. If you ain't sitting here tonight, you ain't never had the debt taken care of, 
I'd come to him and let him take care of all of it this evening. Just let him take care of it, friend. The price has already been paid. Just come and let it be appropriated to your sinful account tonight. Glory to God. I love my master because of a purchase. Can I carry on just a little bit longer? It gets, be it gets better than that. That's South Georgia for better than that. It gets better than that. He said, I don't just love him because of a purchase. He said, I love him because since he purchased me, I love him because of his provisions. Watch what the master has provided. Verse 4. If his master have given him a wife and she have borne him sons or daughters the wife and her children shall be her masters he shall go out by himself and the servants shall plainly say I love my master but watch what he realizes is tied to the master he put the master first I love him first I love my master but watch what's tied to the master because he give it all to me my wife and my children. It's all his. <laughs> see, see the, the context where we're at here, uh, it, it, when we get to, chapter, to verse number 6, we're going we're gonna to realize the whole context of what this is, it's, it's almost looking back in the past of what has happened in this man's past because of the day he's at. The day he's at in verse 6 is judgment day. He's going to go stand in the gates of the city and proclaim his lo loyalty and his allegiance to the master that he loves. And the picture in the text is this. It's judgment day, and his mind is reminiscing on all that the master has done for him. Brother Foster, he wakes up on judgment day. And when he wakes up on judgment day, brother... He opens his eyes and he looks and there's a roof over his head and he's laid in a nice warm bed. And immediately his mind goes back and he remembers, I remember what it was like to be evicted. I remember what it was like not to have anywhere to lay my head down. I was broke, busted, and disgusted and standing on an auction block and he looks at that roof over his head and fills them blankets up over him. He says, man, he's been good to me. He gets out of bed and he starts walking down the hall to the kitchen and he already smells the breakfast wafting down the hallway into his nostrils. He fixing to eat. Walks in the kitchen and there stands his wife cooking breakfast as she turns around, walks over to him and kisses him and says, Good morning, honey, I love you. And it's different on this day than it's ever been before because it's judgment day. He's reminiscing. And I can see big old tears well up in his eyes and he just kind of looks at her and she says, well, what's wrong? He says, oh, I love my master. He gave you to me. I'd have never met you if it wasn't for him. You are a blessing of my master. About that time he hears little feet running down the hall. Says he got children. Brother Jordan, and he hears little, little voices saying, Daddy... He turns around and looks at his youngins come and grab him by both legs and says, Good morning, Daddy. We love you. He picks some babies up and holds them and says, He gave y'all to me. And this old boy looks around at everything in his life. Clothes on his back, shoes on his feet, food fitting to be in his belly, a wonderful wife and beautiful little children and a roof over his head and every good thing in his life, he says... I love my master. Say, so why in the world do you make such a big deal out of Jesus, running around the country and hollering about Jesus and all that? Because I, I feel the same way this fellow feels. Everything in my life, I know where I can trace it back to. I can't claim anything. I can't poke my fingers in my lapel and poke my chest out and say, well, I'll tell you why I got what I got. Oh, Zora done pretty good for herself. Oh, no. Oh, no. I have to bow my unworthy head, lift my unworthy hands, and say like James said, every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, whom there's no shatter, neither variableness or turning. 
every good thing in my life I can trace it back to the doorstep of the good grace and mercy of my Savior it's all because of him it's not because of me he's been a good master I can't ever read this text and read this stuff without thinking about how good he's been in my life brother Doug I read this thing and I think just like the servant I met my wife at church at the master's house and I look at my wife we're soon to be married 18 years and I look at her and I realize he gave you to me I got four beautiful children my oldest just turned 16 pray for me my second one's 15 let me use my left hand y'all pray for me on that one too Three beautiful girls and a little boy had cancer when he was four years old and God brought him through that. He lives with one kidney, but he does just fine. You never know any different. Now look at the goodness of God in my life. God lets me pastor one. What I seem to be one of the greatest churches on the planet. Great people that God lets me preach to. God lets me meet wonderful people like you on a regular basis. And I just look around and I say, I love my pastor. Man, he's been better to me than I've ever deserved. Let me pause right here and say something to all the church brats in the building. I talk like that because I am one. Second generation Christians is what I'm talking about. People that, that you ain't never know nothing but the master's house. Didn't, God didn't get you off a bar stool. God didn't get you out the crack house. You never know nothing but living in the master's house. You had to be bought and purchased just like everybody else did. But I want to say this, and what a blessing it is to all you second generation Christians, whoever all they are in here. Listen to me. Don't you ever resent the fact that God lets you be born in the master's house. So I'm going to tell you what, we're living in a day, Brother Doug, where we got a bunch of sorry, good-for-nothing, bitter, mean-spirited, left-wing liberal lunatics that they're mad because they was brought up in old-time religion. They're mad about having a King James Bible preached to them. They're mad about the fact they couldn't social drink, and they couldn't suck cigarettes, and they couldn't do whatever they want, and now they're mad about all of it, so now they talk bad about where they were grown up at. I ain't bitter or mad about none of it. I'm tickled to death that I've been around this all my life. I thank God I've been around preaching, been around. I thank God I, I never had to watch Daddy come in drunk and beat old Mama. I ain't never watched Mama hung over with a drunken stupor. I got to watch a Mama and a Daddy that loved God and took me to church, lived for Jesus. That's all because of the Master. It's all because the Master intervened in a messed up life and put me where I am today. All you, all you second generation Christians ought to thank God that you are this evening. He's provided for us. Never went lacking. I was reading the other day and thought about that maniac of Gadara over there, the, the demoniac, thousand legion of devils in him or whatever over there. The Bible said that crazy nut was pulling them devils and he run around naked, crying, cutting himself, couldn't be tamed. But the Bible said after he met the master, yeah. when they come back out of the city, he, he had three distinct characteristics that was different than when they saw him before. He was sitting, whereas before nobody could tame him and he wouldn't sit down and be still. He was running around. He, he was clothed, whereas before he'd been naked. And he was in his right mind, whereas before he'd been crazy. And I can imagine they walked up to that fella and said, Hey, you, you, you settled down there. You're sitting. Where'd you get that, that piece from? And he said, he give it to me. Man, you got clothes on. We ain't never seen you with clothes. You always run around in your birthday suit. Man. Where'd you get them clothes from? He said, he gave them to me. Where do you think he got them from? They didn't go back to town. The disciples obviously had an extra extra cloak, extra coat, something like that. And Jesus said, hey, y'all pitch in. Give the old boy some clothes to put on. Man, you talking straight now. I mean, you actually make sense when you talk to me. You ain't talking like, I'm leading them in here. You're actually talking like you got sins. Where'd you get that sound mind from? He gave it to me. 
And that fellow run back home and he told him, every good thing I've got, let me tell y'all something, every good thing i got, it all come from him. It all come from him. It was all because of him. And this evening we owe it all to our master tonight. Cause of purchase, cause of provisions. Can I throw this out, verse 6, and we're done. We see because of the purchase and because of these good provisions, we find now that the servant makes a proclamation. A public proclamation. Watch what he says, verse number 6. Watch what happens here. After he says, I love my master, my wife, my children, I'll not go out free. Verse 6, then his master shall bring him unto the judges. Can I pause right here and say, when they come before the judges, it is not for the, it is not for the master to speak. Preacher, it's not for the master to speak here because the master could say whatever he wanted to say and fabricate a story just to keep the servant with him. The master could step up and, and they look at the servant and say, Hey, you love that guy? You want to stay with your master? And the master could step in between them and say, Hey, just shut up. Yeah, he loves me to death, son. I've been good to him. No, no, no. It's not for the master to speak on this day. It's the servant's job to speak. The master stands to the side, and we're going to hear testimony from the servant today. And the judges say, Hey, you want to stay with him? And he, Oh, yeah. I love him. <laughs> he been good to me. Yeah. Well, if you'd have seen me when he found me, you'd know why I love him. Yeah. And this is what happened. Watch the public proclamation. This, this, this gets extreme. He shall also bring him to the door, or unto the door post, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. I mean, this gets right extreme. He lays his ear down on this door post or against this door and the master takes the awl and the hammer and he pokes an indelible imprint, a permanent mark in his ear. I thought about, I thought about retitling this message and preaching on the day I got my ear pierced. <laughs> Walk around with a clip-on earring on there. But my wife told me, she said, Zorn, you know people that wear clip on, you know, earrings on the right ear, that means they. And I said, Well, I'll put it on my left ear. She said, Well, that means you're only that far from being. I said, Well, just forget it. I'll just change the title of the message and I'll just preach on a loving master. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to be no mistaken about nothing. I mean, this is right extreme. Don't y'all agree? What an extreme proclamation. See, 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 y'all, if, if this was in 2022, you know, if this was up to date in 2022, you know, contemporary day, this is the way this thing would go. In 2022, it, it'd go something like this. The, the servant would look at his master and say, Now look, I love you. We tight. I appreciate the purchase. I appreciate the provisions. You know I love you. But this public display that you're going to make me do. And that's getting a little bit extreme, isn't it? I mean, people might even say it's legalistic. It's kind of narrow. I mean, come on, look, I'll, I'll come home at night and still live under your roof. I'll still work for you. But you realize, if you put that hole in my ear, everybody's going to know that I'm a servant. I'd like to just fly under the radar and act like I'm like everybody else. If you put that hole in my ear, you know what that means? That means these places I can't go. That means people will think I'm, dare I say a Bible word, peculiar. People will look at me different. I will not be accepted by everybody if you put that hole in my ear because it's an imprint that lets everybody know I belong to someone. And you know people just don't really respect servants a whole lot. You know, they just don't think a lot of servants. <laughs> We're living in a church world today where that's the mindset. The mindset today is, oh, I love Jesus, and thank you, Jesus, and oh, I love my Lord Jesus, and thank you, thank you, Jesus. But now this idea, now hold on now, this idea that, you know, uh, we're going to put a mark on my life that's going to preclude me from places I can go, 
that's going to hinder me from things I want to wear or things I want to do or people I want to hang out with or stuff I want to listen to. No, 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 just legalism is all that is. It's just legalism. And you're just trying, you're just trying to be legal. No, 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 you're trying to be a liberal. Right. Right. Huh, how'd you like that? Huh? Call me a legalist, I call you a liberal. Touche. They, hey, hey, we're living in a day nobody wants an identifiable mark anymore that I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. There is nothing wrong with having some outward indications of an inward condition. See, let me, let me can I rewind? Let's rewind and come back over here again to the master. See, you know, if we was living, if we was bringing this story up 2022, they'd say something like this. We ain't got to put that mark on my ear. I've got your mark on my heart. <laughs> and you know, God looks on the heart. So, don't need a mark on my ear because God sees my heart. Yeah, that's just one problem with that. Nobody else can. Right. Yeah, your testimony is not for God. He knows your heart. A testimony is for the lost world. We're living in a day, you say, I don't, I don't believe we're living in a day where Christians don't want to mark. Really? Have you looked at modern contemporary worship services of the day? It sounds just like a rock and roll concert. Looks just like a barroom rock and roll concert. Got some dude get up there in his skinny jeans and his little girly boots that he stole out of his wife's closet and have a little rap session with the congregation and have a little talk and all this. And I mean, it's just a little motivational speech and the whole. I mean, it looks just like something out of the world. They don't want no. Let's, let's not make a mark where we make anybody feel uncomfortable or nothing like that. Hey, 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 friend. If a Mark makes you uncomfortable. Maybe you ain't joined up with the right master tonight. See, point number one and point number two is a blessing. Ain't that a blessing? Everybody likes point one and two. You know why people like point one and two? Because that's God doing something for them. But point three goes beyond God just doing something for you. Now we moved on to you doing something for the master. Can I say, he has been good to us. He did purchase us. He did provide for us. And all he asks now is that we make a public proclamation that we love him. That we belong to him. That we are not our own. Y'all, Paul said it like this. I'm done. Paul said it like this. First Corinthians chapter number 6. What? No, you're not. That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which you have of God. And ye are not your own. Why? Because of a purchase. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, in light of that fact, glorify God in your body outwardly and in your spirit inwardly. And he said both of them's God's. Which are God. See, this servant master thing, this servant master thing gets way far out there, gets way out. As a servant, you have absolutely no say in anything. I mean, I hate to tell all us Christians in here something, but if you've been blood-bought, blood-washed, born again from above, you don't have no say over your life no more. God don't just want some of your life, He wants all of your life. Matter of fact, He demands it all because He bought it all. And you don't even belong to you no more. Your job now is to follow what the master said. You say, well, man, that's going to crimp my style, preacher, and that's just going to hinder me. No, no. Like the old song said, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You want to see a miserable servant? You want to see a miserable servant? That's a servant that is not doing his master's bidding. See, I hate to tell you this, but because of a fall in the whole nine yards, and even before that, the way God designed and created man, He created him to serve something and somebody. Right, that's right. <laughs> we, our mindset's so messed up. Somebody better come to the piano. I'm going to keep on preaching, praise God. Who's, who's playing for us? Sister, would you come play something for us? Brother James, sing something for us, whatever you want to do. Somewhere we got this mindset that we are made just to do our own thing. We ain't. God made a man, put him in a garden, and told him what to do. Right. He was God's servant. Right. 
And brother, when you get born again, you are God's servant. You don't call your own shots. You don't live where you want to live. You don't do what you want to do. You, you, he controls it all. Say, I don't like that. Shouldn't have got saved. Should have just went on to hell. Yeah. I'd say we got a pretty good trade, Brother Doug. We don't go to hell. He gives us heaven, saves us by His grace, gives us real joy, gives us real peace. And some people say, well, preacher, I, 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 I'm, I'm living my own. I don't want a master over me. No, no, if you're lost, you've got a master over you. The devil's your master. The God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. You have a master tonight. You just don't realize it. But he's the cruelest, sorriest, good-for-nothing, low-down, rotten, scallywag you ever met in your life. He's ruining your life, taking you to hell, and making you think he's so smart, he makes you think you're in charge. You ain't. You, you put your Pinocchio on the puppet string, and he's controlling your life. You don't even know it. Greatest day of my life is when the Lord come along, cut the strings, severed the cords, put His Spirit inside of me, made me alive, gave me something and somebody worth living for. And y'all, I don't just serve Jesus because I have to. I serve Him because I want to. I want to. He's been so good to me. How can I help but let this world know I love my master? Tonight, if he's not your master, won't you come down here and let us introduce you to him? And if he is your master, won't you thank him for a purchase, for some provisions? But then make your mind up, I'm going to go make a proclamation. I am not ashamed to be his servant. Let's all stand tonight. Father, thank you so much for good liberty. Thank you, Lord, for the good singing. I want to say personally and publicly in front of this whole crowd and whoever would watch this later on, I love my master, the Lord Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of you. You were not ashamed of me. You gave your all for me. You were identified with me on the cross. Lord, now you ask me to be identified with you. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.